had some Dell stuff. Now, even if you never buy from Dell, you need to pay attention to what they're doing because of what they become and where they are. But the understanding in all of this is to remember that in IT, if there's a single word that describes IT, I think that word is change. I truly don't know that we manage technology anymore. I think we manage change more than we actually manage technology. And the hardest job, I believe, out there in industry today is that of a CIO. Because everything that you touch, everything that you manage, is changing at an incredible rate. And nobody's throwing any more money at you. And the data is growing at incredible rates. How fast is that data growing? I saw a study, uh, I think IBM did it last year, and I read it about four or five months ago. But here's what IBM says. In the last three years, we have created more data in the last three years than all of human history combined. Now, while that's an astounding statement, the one that shocks me is the one that followed me. And that same statement will be true for the next eight years. So what's the disruptor in IT? It's data. That's the disruptor. Okay? And so why at this point does a, a technology acquisition matter? Well, let's take a look back into history, right? 1979, um, Richard Egan and Roger Marino started a company, the uh, Egan Marino Corporation, <laughs> EMC, right? And what they were doing is they were creating memory boards for prime, prime computers. You've got to look for the gray beards so you even remember who those guys were, right? But that's what they did starting in 79. 1988, um, Michael Rutgers, who was the CEO, launched a new product and a new initiative, Symmetrix. Again, gray beards are the only ones who remember this, this product. But what happened was <coughs> EMC at that point did something that was unheard of. Totally unheard of, never before imagined. Because you have to understand who IBM was back in 1990 and in the 80s and before. There had never been a company like that on the planet. Nothing like that. They had the respect of everybody. They were computing. Right? Never had a layoff. Never had one of the most respected organizations ever, if not the single most respected one ever. And their moneymaker was memory and DASD, direct access storage device. Again, gray beards, right? This. That's where they made all their money. What Symmetrix did is it went after disk. It did disk. And they learned something in that process that if we're going to do this and take this away from IBM, we've got to be better, faster, less expensive. And we've got to support it better because anything that goes wrong, including the drinking fountain down the hall, we're going to get blamed for. So they brought incredible engineering to that. The success, well, if some of you remember what happened in the 90s when we started wiring up the planet and doing all this internet stuff that started happening. There was this stock boom, if you remember it. It was incredible. Never seen anything like it in the history of this industry, or the world. During that period of time, from 1990 to 2000, EMC created more value from their stock value, enormous wealth creation, and value to shareholders. <coughs> and during that period of time, they were the number two company in value creation because of what they did, focusing in on some metrics. Then in 2001, the CEO at the time, Joe Tucci, made another, he made another acquisition from Data General, and that was a storage box, which became Clarion, which became VNX, which became Unity, those of you familiar with the EMC product line, right? And so they started pivoting out and doing other things. They started acquiring other companies. You've heard of DDU from uh, uh, Data Domain. They created deduplication and that terminology. They bought this little company called VMware, okay? Then in 2009, they created VCE, VMware, Cisco, EMC, and started converged infrastructure. 
EMC's legacy is powerful and strong. And they've done amazing things along the way. They have a different culture. Not everybody's happy with who they are, et cetera, et cetera. But their presence in the data center is unquestioned. Unquestioned. <coughs> so in 2015, their last year as a, a publicly traded company, their revenues were $25 billion. $25 billion. They had, and it's all in that enterprise space. Interesting. Okay? Now, let's go back to Dell. It's another one of those great stories. You remember the two guys in the garage up in uh, Silicon Valley that kind of changed the world and see Wozniak and Jobs, right? And they kind of did that in the garage. Well, there was this kid about 10, 15 years later in, uh, in a dorm room in Austin, Texas. <coughs> and he realized that the world was changing, that these PC things were really going to start impacting and changing everything. But you couldn't buy what you wanted. You could only buy what was offered. Okay? And if you wanted what you wanted, you had to go buy it out of a back of magazine and build it. So Michael Dell started a company to give you what you want and deliver it at a price. Pretty interesting. Okay? Pretty interesting. And it actually worked out pretty well. And with another, another sideline on this. Michael never wanted to call it a Dell computer. He called it, I think, I think the first name was. Uh, American Computing Company or something. So he's together with the attorneys and whatever, and they're signed to get ready to sign all the incorporations. <coughs> and what happened is they came in and said, now that name's being used. We've got to come up with another one. He goes, and they said, well, let's just call it Dell Computers. He goes, I don't want to call it Dell Computers. Oh, fine. Signs of papers. <coughs> anyway. it, it worked out pretty well because what they did is they understood what they were doing. And Dell, through that period, grew and grew massive global company. And then as we got into the 21st century, they, you know, the servers and networking products and things of that nature and started to diversify more. But nonetheless, keep in mind what Dell was. They were providing in the last, that period of time, commodities. Because PCs became commodities. At first they were, oh, they were game changing, right? They become commodities. Servers have come to become commodities. And those networking boxes they were selling became commodities. But the company, $70 billion at the time, $70 billion of being able to bend metal and ship and, and do very important things about that level of it during that same period of time now that EMC is at the enterprise space in different realms, both very knowledgeable and good at their different areas. <coughs> so where I'm going to go with this is I'm going to talk to you, in, you know, Brent's got a few other things to talk about, but then I'm going to come back and talk about the vision that they put together and why this comes together at incredible time. But one last data point. Remember the 90s, that stock value? EMC was number two. You know who was number one? Dell. Interesting, isn't it? The two companies that during that 90s set different paths and course, enormous valuation and change, Made Michael the 17th richest man on the planet. I think it worked out pretty well for him. Yeah. No? But now they've come back together at this point to start something new. I think the history is important as to why this matters at this point in our industry. So you want to talk about something for a while? Sure. Because you know me, I'll go on until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> They're all very well aware. <laughs> So I mentioned earlier um, that Dell has made a number of acquisitions. Um, I'm sure that y'all are familiar with a lot of them, right? EMC makes big news, Compellent makes big news, Equalogic makes big news, Case, so on and so forth. There's a lot of little companies that you've probably never even heard of that they've acquired as well too over the years. And again, going back to my original point, it wasn't to destroy the intellectual property, but rather enhance the product portfolio that Dell has today. So this is just a list of some of them. I tried to run down all of them, and I attempted to start finding logos, but I found out that was going to be way too much work. So you got the poor man's version here. Um, so they've made over 35 acquisitions since 1999. Some of those, you'll, again, you'll probably recognize, and some of those you won't. The thing that I think is important about this is um, I'd say the question that I get asked most often by clients, um, all industries, all aspects of life, asking me, you know, what's going to happen with fill in the blank, right? What's going to happen with Equalogic? What's going to happen with Compellent? 
And again, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have a crystal ball. I can't sit here and tell you, well, this is what's going to happen, and much less Michael Dell's not engaging in those types of conversations. But if you can take a look at what history is, has proven with um, Dell and their acquisitions, it's they always allow you a path forward. And what I mean by that, and I was actually just having this conversation with, with Todd last night at dinner, was if you look at history, so uh, back in 2011, Dell acquired uh, Compellent. At the time, prior to acquiring Compellent, they had two offerings. They had Equalogic, which is the number one iSCSI stand in the world, and they had EMC as the number one, they were EMC's number one partner, as I mentioned. They bought Compellent, and EMC wasn't too stoked on that and, and told Dell to kick rocks, right? So they, they took off, and so you got Compellent. Was that a direct quote? Direct quote, kick rocks. <laughs> Um, so you've got these two under the, these two storage entities uh, now under the same roof. You've got Compellent, you've got Equalogic. Whereas yesterday, you know, prior to the acquisition, they were competing products, and we carried both. And we would go in and have conversations with customers and really figure out what their needs were, what their environment looked like, what kind of IT manpower they had in house, and from there, really decide what was the best fit for the customer. For everybody else that wasn't carrying both product lines, they were competing products. So the very first Dell storage forum where these two products came together, it was down in Orlando, uh, in, I think it was summer of 2011, you could cut the tension in the room with a knife, right? Everybody's whispering, everybody's saying Equalogic's going away, everybody's saying Compound's going away, and finally the executives stood up and said, listen, nothing's going away. I mean, eventually there may be some products merging, but we've got a long road ahead of us before we can get these engineering groups together to even start having those types of conversations. So everybody just squash all that and just move forward with, if you've got Equalogic, you're safe. If you've got Compellent, you're safe. And so that announcement really calmed everybody. There was a lot of concern in the room, too, for those of you that are legacy Compellent partners, or excuse me, legacy Compellent customers, um, about how great Copilot was, right? Copilot, which is a uh, Compellent support organization, um, is far and above any other support organization that's ever been out there. And there was a lot of concern after the acquisition uh, of Compellent by Dell that essentially Copilot was going to be turned into Dell support. And at the time, this was coming off of the late 2000s where Dell had ex you know, sent all of their support overseas and there was a lot of frustration around that. So there was a lot of concern amongst these legacy Compellent customers about the product essentially being ruined. Um, so the first question when the mic opened up and Michael Dell was on stage, somebody came up from the audience. And this audience is filled with partners like us, customers like you on both sides of the fence, Equal Logic and Compellent. The first question was, what are you going to do with Copilot? And Michael's response was perfect. It was, we're not doing anything with Copilot. If anything, what we're going to do is take this cult following that everybody loves so much about Copilot, figure out how to duplicate it and replicate it across all of the other product lines. Um, so they've gotten a lot closer to doing that. It's still not exactly what it was pre-acquisition, but I mean, you think about it, and you had a very small company like Compellent, and you've got a very big company like Dell, it's never going to be the exact same thing. But I will say that the support has gotten much better across the board, and that's a direct impact of those acquisitions. Um, but again, the point being, none of these products are going away. So a great example of this is you fast forward five years, and you're, we're up to last year, right, 2016, and both products are still for sale. In fact, Equalogic is still going to be for sale, I believe, until the end of 2018. Can you check me on that, Fred? Is that right? End of 2018. And it's going to be supported for five years after that. So even if you're an existing Equalogic customer today, you could still continue to buy Equalogic today if you wanted to, and you'd have a path forward. To take it a step further, what Dell did was they basically got the engineers together from both product groups and figured out a way that you can cross-replicate between the two different platforms and leverage one GUI, one interface, which is now called Dell, Dell Storage Manager. So what they've allowed is, and this is a perfect example, we've got a customer down in South Carolina that had a rather large Equalogic environment. They had five, five SANs on their primary side and five SANs on their DR side, and they were essentially running out of space. And it'd be simple for them to buy another Equalogic, and we gave them that option as well, too, and we kind of talked about what all their options were. But I also want to let them know, look, big picture, Equalogic's going away. So while you can continue to, to purchase Equalogic today, um, at some point it's going to be going away, and here's kind of the path forward, and that was through a, a compelling SC4020. Um, so what they essentially did was they took those five SANs that were sitting at their primary, moved them over to their DR, so they had investment protection on the stuff that they had already bought, and made one big SAN over on their DR site, and then put a new all-flash 4020 over on their primary site, and they're now able to replicate between the two and manage it from one interface. I think that's a pretty powerful story and a pretty powerful message, because you see a lot of acquisitions go down in this industry, and there's never a path forward. In fact, most of the competition, uh, including EMC up until you know recently, 
is a rip and replace every time you need to add more storage or you outgrow your SAN. Compellent has always said no forklift upgrades from the <coughs> outset, right? You can a la carte these drives, a la carte these cards. If you change from fiber channel to iSCSI, you don't have to buy a new SAN. It's simply just buying a new card. And the fact that Dell has kind of put their heads together on both of these product groups and really given these customers a path forward, I think is a huge message that should resonate through everybody in this room. So when I get the question of what's going to happen to Equal Logic, what's going to happen if I'm a compelling customer, what's going to happen if I have Unity, and so on and so forth, while I don't know, if you look at history, Michael Dell has not destroyed any of this, pro any of this intellectual property. In fact, he's made it where there's a path forward. <clears throat> So, I really like that visual. Did you, did you create that? What is it? <laughs> no, I think that's my last slide. Okay. Yeah. No, this is, that, that one's for you. So, let's talk a little bit about the impact on the industry. Um, actually, I think you created that slide. The font, the font was all off. <laughs> so, the impact on the industry, right? This is not just about product sets any longer. It's now kind of about this total solution and how it's all going to work together. Paul mentioned the industry's changing, right? We've got all these different things flying at us, buzzwords like cloud, hyperconverged, all of that. And Dell has a plethora of offerings around all of that. And the good news is, is you really have a path forward, not only from the product sets that you have today, but also if you want to start pushing some stuff to the cloud or all stuff to the cloud, or maybe you want DR as a service. It, now that Dell's kind of brought all of this together under one roof, you've got all these, all these capabilities available to you. Um, and that's something that we can help you all with as well, too. I mean, if you all need us to come in and kind of outline what's going on in the industry, what options are available for you all to have, a, have an educated discussion or decision around what you want to do moving forward, that's something that we offer, obviously, at no cost, and we're happy to help you with that. But the good news is, is there is a path forward. Um, again, there's been a major shift in the industry, as Paul was saying, just because um, all these major technologies have kind of come under one roof, and I think what you're going to continue to see is product enhancements across the board. I think you're going to start seeing more native VMware capabilities across product sets, and I really think that what's going to happen is you're going to have this one big cohesive infrastructure, if you will, to be managed under one pane of glass. That was really the direction that Dell was going even prior to the EMC acquisition, and I think with EMC's talented engineers, and I think with EMC's product portfolio, you're only going to continue to see that enhance. Um, so that really brings us to the next slide, which I already showed you. I don't know if you know this or not, uh, but Dell's number one in everything. And when I mean number one in everything, I mean number one in everything from either units shipped or uh, you know in the Gar Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, but everything. So if you look up here on the side on the slide, I mean you've got servers, you've got storage, you've got virtualization, pretty much anything that's of interest to us in this room today or things that we're running in our data centers or discussions that we're having day in and day out, Dell is number one in. That's a pretty powerful message that after the acquisition, day one, they came out of the gate number one in everything. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm going to pivot back over to Paul, and he's going to give you a brief history of, uh, of Michael Dell's vision and kind of where things are going. And then from there, we can uh, get to the important stuff, which is that TV. Has everybody had a chance to sign the sign-in sheet? You have not? Okay. Paul? And make sure you put your home phone number on these things, too, because then we sell them off so we can pay for them. <laughs> okay. Where do I sign up? Um, we started talking about this being an important shift in the industry, and again, it's not just about products. In fact, it's not about products at all. It's also about relationships. It's about the other vendors. It's about everybody else in the marketplace. What do I mean by that? Perfect example. Who is the dominant player in network? There's only one 800-pound gorilla in that one, right? Just one. Who has been their closest business partner for 20 years? EMC. Cisco and EMC, tied at the hip. <coughs> EMC's sales force was always selling Cisco and positioning Cisco. Think that's going to continue? You don't think things changed a little bit? Uh, under Mr. Robbins uh, taking over for Chambers at, at Cisco. You don't think there's a little bit of a change happening there? 
Yeah, there's a significant change happening there. Because network, what have we learned about technology? What have we learned from virtualization? We virtualize servers, we virtualize uh, storage, right? So we want uh, fast driving, hard pounding, inexpensive hardware with software driving everything, right? That's how we do stuff. That's how we can change stuff out. How's that working in the network? Think it might happen? Changes are coming, folks. <laughs> They're coming. And with those relationships shifting, what ha what's happened to Hewlett Packard other than it being a tragedy? I mean, really, I've been a huge fan of Hewlett Packard forever. What an incredible company with incredible people and incredible products. <coughs> and the board of directors should be criminally held, criminally responsible for hiring five drunken sailors in a row to run that company. They fired five CEOs right in a row until they hired me. This was just tragic. But as a result, they've also had to change their company after all of that horrible leadership, and they're breaking it up. <coughs> Things are changing in the industry, and these are the people that create the stuff that you end up implementing. There's always going to be great new bright shiny objects in the marketplace. That's what's really cool about all this stuff. There's always new stuff coming out of it. But it's the forces of the industry that actually drive where we end up. They pick up this stuff and make it better and more, more available to all of us. So these changing winds come back in more ways than just, oh, what am I buying today? It matters. <coughs> and what I think is really important is understanding that about eight or nine years ago, Michael Dell came to the realization that the future of his company was not PCs. Okay? I mean, he became the 17th richest man in the world, an incredible company, et cetera, et cetera, and it's all basically PC-based and commodity-based, and he knew that with where the world was at, it was not going to be his future. He's going to continue to sell those and make them, et cetera. It's a legacy. But that wasn't the future. He knew it would lie somewhere else. And so what he did at the time is he brought together some of the brightest minds on the planet, and they had some conversations about what should IT be? What should it be? Not what can we build or what can we buy, but what should IT be? So there was a lot of interesting discussion, timing, and, and et cetera, and all that. But when, they were, when they came up with what that vision of IT was, Michael Dell walked up to the table and dropped $18 billion and said, okay, $18 billion. And in that moment, one of the most incredible in, uh, forces in our industry happened with a new startup, if you will. A startup with enormous cash, enormous intellectual resources, protected by a $70 billion company surrounding it and a vision for where to go. You saw on the last slide a list of the companies that were purchased. They weren't bought to have another backup product or another piece of something. It wasn't a point product. They were looking for the intellectual property that fit into that vision so they could build what it's supposed to be. Wow. That's pretty cool. And from our side, we saw that happening, but there was a really big problem. They were coming together with this incredible end-to-end -end product set. But it didn't match the company. Dell, as a company, made commodities. Shipped boxes. Worried about contracts. That's what you do when you build commodities. And they were great at it. But enterprise, end-to-end, -end, the company wasn't built for that. So what did Michael do? He plunked down another $25 billion and bought the company back to change it, to match the product set. Oh. And then some of the analysts were talking about, well, I mean, I saw this interview with Michael, it was really kind of funny. He said, but don't you understand the amount of uh, debt repayment that you've got to pay with all of that? And, and, the, and Michael just smiled and looked at him and said, I can put that on my credit card. And, <laughs> but in that moment, you started realizing, who else was in a position to do something like who else was in a position to put this thing together? Well, yeah. 
because he also understood the financing and everything else that goes into doing something of this magnitude. And then, of course, came EMC. $67 billion. Are you paying attention yet? It's $110 billion put into this entity. And on day one, February 1st of this year, they hadn't even found the coffee pot or the bathrooms of the new entity, and they're number one in everything they do. Again, number one either in market share, unit share, or Gardner's Magic Quad. That's on the first day they got there. They don't even know what they're going to build yet. They don't even know the direction they're going to go. But this is the force they are as they're figuring out who they report to. Change is coming, folks. And it's going to be interesting. Again, you never have to buy a thing from Dell. You never have to buy a thing from us. That's not the point of the conversation. But if you hear Michael Dell is speaking, or he's got a, or you got something that he's, uh, uh, a transcript of a recent interview, watch it. Pay attention. I mean, you saw the companies, I and mean, it's not only EMC, it's not only Dell. VMware? Buckets. Two security companies? And you want to know one of the most powerful things? Of, uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with it, there's a product VMware sells, it's their open networking product called NSX, right? It's, first off, it's pretty, pretty basic stuff. But VMware has the gravitas to take on Cisco because they're that innovative. But there's a piece in it that is pretty interesting. When you start thinking about security, security for most of us across the board is, well, we, put, we got a firewall up, right? But firewall is like in the 18th century, I got a castle and a moat to keep the hordes out, right? That's what a firewall is, it's a castle and a moat. Well, what do we know? They're going to get in. They're going to get in. We all know that. It's, it's kind of like backup in the old days. Hey, does your backup work? I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Today, it's security. It's, hey, I just get, yeah, I don't want to talk about that. Because we don't want to talk about it. It's scary stuff. But what does NSX do? That's why I'm going back to it is that, okay, yeah, we got our firewall, we got our cross, you know, we got everything in place. But what NSX does is once they get in, their micro segmentation, you can't get around it and do anything. You're locked into a little, 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 little place. So it can't spread if you're locked in. Ooh. Is that attractive? You want to move stuff between clouds and around? The existing system architecture is not And it's exit built in. Those things are common. The industry is going to change. I mean, pay attention. It's been changing all of the while we've been doing this. Every day since I've gone to work in this industry since 1980, well, we're not going to get it. It's been a long time ago. It's been changing. And I started off, the guy on the keyboard making the stuff work, right? Within two years of starting in this industry, I realized the kids coming out of college were smarter than I was, and so how could I possibly keep up with them? You think that's just slowed down? Look at these kids coming out of college. Whew. They're wicked smart. So we bring experience and knowledge to the game, right? But we have seen everything change, and the rate of change is what is astounding at this point in time. And that is why, with the funding, the global presence, the end-to-end -end approach, VMware, EMC, Dell. Michael said something just last week. It's profound. He said, you know, I bought Joe Tucci's house. Joe Tucci was the CEO of EMC. I bought Joe Tucci's house, and I found a couple of Picassos in the basement. <laughs> Didn't even know they were there. He was talking about Pivotal and Virtue Strength. Pay attention to what they do. And say, buy it. Pay attention, because that's where the industry is going. It was six months ago, I, was, I had a, another speaking gig, and I started talking about the fact that if you knew the future, 
would you architect differently? If you knew five years ago that you could put 200 terabytes of flash in the belly of a server, would you architect it differently? If you knew three or four years ago that in five years you'd be able to buy a 100 terabyte flash drive, would you architect differently? And the answer is usually, yeah. If I knew where I was going, we don't know in our industry. This is one of those points where we get a glimpse, at least, not just from Gartner, not just from the others, but also from where the companies are investing their money. And the one that matters the most in this conversation, to me, is Dell Technologies. Because it's no longer Dell. It's no longer the guys who make the PCs and the low-cost networking boxes and, you know, pretty good servers, right? It's not Dell anymore. Yeah, all that's still there. But look at what has transpired. And that is the overriding message that I wanted you to understand today. It's, it's, no, it's nothing deep, it's nothing that profound, but it's like, oh, in the midst of all the stuff we do on a daily basis, I mean, just keeping things together, how much time do we get a chance to step back and think about where things are going? Sit back and want, pay attention to what these folks do. You will be astounded because, again, the R&D teams are still trying to figure each other out. They're smart and they're rapid and they're going to be able to move. We're going to see stuff happening. I think it was Brandon was saying earlier, I had, I had customers talk, asking me, so do you think these products are going to change? Well, yeah, of course they're going to change. Well, is it going to be around? It's going to change. But the point is, there will be paths to get to wherever you want to go based on what you're currently buying. If you, you know, you're buying from those, those companies. If you're not, it doesn't matter. But if you are buying from them, there will be paths. Often they turn out to be marketing paths, and we are the ones who have to figure it out. So you want to go from here to here, and it's like, oh, yeah. Somebody call BJ? <laughs> you know, get, get our engineers in here and figure it out. But we, th that becomes our job, not yours. The point is that there will be paths in the future, but there will be change, and it will be profound, and it will make your lives easier in that what we've also seen in our industry is that tasks and things that we do that used to require a lot of smarts and a lot of talent and a lot of people and a lot of hours turn out to be a mouse click, right? We get those things get better when we put our brains into other things. That's going to happen again, and it's going to, that's what I think we're going to see more of in the next five years, is the stuff that eats up your time is going to get sucked into software and become mouse clicks, so that you can go take your brains and put them on other problems. That's what's really going to start happening. We're going to see hardware get smaller, and you know the data center in one U, I'm still blown away by that stuff, and especially a guy who was selling you know, eight-inch floppy disk drives in the 80s. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> remember those things? You remember those things. You know? And to see this stuff now, it's, I'm having more fun than I've ever had in my life. Because you're seeing what's coming. And that it's only going to continue. I often say that 500 years from now, as historians are writing about history and what has transpired across the human experience, their fingers are going to be on right at this moment in history as to when it all changed. We're living in history every day. We're building. And you in the public space, you've got a different, an entirely different obligation than those in the, in the commercial space. You're responsible for data forever. For the generations not even born, you're responsible for this data, for them. 50 years from now, there's going to be a kid in Monroe that's in high school who's got an idea, and he starts digging in and needs to find your information that you had. You know, you're a long dad. He's digging into it. And he may be able to change the course of human existence. But that's your obligation. Oh, by the way, you've got to keep the systems up and running. And oh, somebody's email's down. And oh, you know, we get lost in all of that. But the obligations are there, and they are profound. And change is part of everything we do. It's sometimes so rapid we can't even see it for the dim that's going on. And then vendor battle. Isn't that just amazing? 
different vendors calling the same thing absolutely entirely different things, and you've got to sit there and take hours to figure out what they're even talking about. This is manufacturers do. They confuse the situation. All of them do it. All of them do it. So the job is difficult, and change is constant. But what's important is that you're aware of where to put your time, energy, and resources. Because you still got a life to live. Okay? You still got a life to live. So, how much time we got left? 15, I think. Okay, that works. Any, any questions for us? Anybody got any questions about this, or you just really just want to get on the TV and go drink coffee? Because we're cool with that. Too. <laughs> Because you guys came, and so I'm really happy, and I know the TV was the draw, believe me. I know the TV was the draw. Yes. So, in noticing all the acquisitions, we know Dell's desktop has been one of the best, but it looks like they're putting a lot of focus on the data center mm -hmm. and infrastructure. What do you think is happening on the desktop On the side? desktop side, the client side? Are they just looking to kind of virtualize, use more... BDI with their VMware acquisition and all the large storage and fast networking. Mm -hmm. You think they're going to push more towards a virtual desktop environment? I don't think they're going to push towards it. They're going to create it so it's available. I mean, for them, I mean, go back. Oh, you're not driving. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Set the back seat. Okay. Um, or maybe make it a little bit but, more affordable. Well, the, the piece here. This is this. This is the company that's doing that right now, right? And so their total, sole focus is client, right? That would be the piece of the client. So they're going to continue to try to make better laptops and desktops and monitors and all those other things, innovative lights. I mean, seriously, you know, all of that stuff, because that's going to be, you know, a, a, a lion's share of what they do. But there are also customers that do want to go VDI. So the option will be choice, and they'll have to create the product set to be able to handle all of that. And that's what they'll do, because they can. See, that's the thing that's important about this conversation is they will because they can. And if you want it, <coughs> you'll buy it. I mean, you'll buy it, which means why wouldn't they put it together? Because they've got the resources. That's the important piece of it. I don't think the PC as a whole will be very big. Uh, so in fact, last week at Dell EMC, two weeks ago at Dell EMC, World, Michael, jo Michael Dell joked that the PC was supposed to be dead three years ago. Because if you remember that when he was taking the company back uh, private, that's what everybody kept saying, right? PC's dead, PC's dead, it's going to be replaced. And Michael and, and the HPs of the world were out there saying, I don't really see this. I don't see this coming. And obviously it hasn't happened yet. So. No, I mean, there's, it, 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 it's all about the devices. I mean, it's all about access points. You know, whether it's a mobile device or it's a tablet or it's, you know, a desktop or a laptop. Everybody's got to get into the system from some point. So, uh, there's going to continue to be innovation in that area, different types of things, as customers say, hey, what about this? Smart engineers hear about it and say, well, let's go see if we can make that thing. Because when you have the resources and the freedom to do so, you build those things. So it'll continue that way. It's just, it's just you know, and it's going to be a normal evolution. So, yes, sir? So um, we talked about HP and those groups being the competitor for Dell at this point. Yeah. But we didn't talk about Amazon and yeah. those other big yeah. drills in the room. What, how, how does that play out for Dell? What's their vision? See, that's what's really interesting is that the relationships between, uh, I mean, Dell is Microsoft's largest customer. Okay? So that relationship's pretty tight. <coughs> is your piece of that is also a natural extension. Um, and Dell also realized, and Dell Technologies realized, that um, Amazon and Google uh, are tremendous forces in the marketplace. And because they're building for themselves, that's where a lot of this innovation is coming, right? So those things are going to continue, but you're not going to see Dell's technology implemented into a Google. <coughs> I mean, unless it's something that's really dramatically different because Google's scale is so off the charts that they literally build their own. But they don't, they're not competitors in that space. Where they're going to become competitors is going to be into where a collective service organization is in the cloud. You know, where some services that you're providing and sitting back on somebody's infrastructure, whether it's AWS or it's Azure or Rackspace or whatever, or Virtustream or you know Pivotal, Pivotal's platform as a service, 
and those types of things. So they'll be competitive natures, but because of the bulk of the size of those entities, it, it's, it's not going to create friction in the near term. <coughs> it depends on how big those businesses get and if they're starting to do this more. But yeah. there's enough business for all of them to play. So the relationships are strong, but they will still all be developing new ways to do things. It's like the container conversations that are going on, right? Um, wow, that sounds really cool. Well, where can you do that? Google? <laughs> I mean, where else can you even play with stuff like that? So you have to have a Google or an Amazon to even try some of this stuff. And then that technology ends up filtering back down to us through other companies that pick up on how to do that. That's the nature of being connected like we are. We all instantly know what's going on. And we can't hear it all because it's, you know, so noisy. But the smart ones who are really connected into those apes find them and then they start doing <coughs> that and we just keep getting bigger and wider and crazy. Any other questions? I think they want a TV. I think they're saying, okay, he's talking now. Get him out of here. Um, so, um, how many numbers do we have? We have 55. 55. And we didn't Thank miss you. Any we thought it was going to be five. Did so. everyone's name, do we miss anyone? Is